so, um, I'm Nathan. Um, I'm from Brisbane. Uh, I worked for a few years at uh, Netbox Blue, software development company, and now I'm working as a sysadmin for a web agency where we deal with a lot of JavaScript and another language beginning with P, which isn't Python. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but sort of to keep myself sane, I did some Python development in my free time. Um, and this Fang is a tool I wrote to solve a particular problem that I've had a lot with Python. I love the language, but there are certain things around how we do dependencies and how the import system works, which makes um, Python a little tricky to deal with sometimes. Uh, and looking at how other languages solve these problems, I came up with what I think is a pitch for a solution. I don't know if it's perfect, but it's something I'd like to start a conversation about. Uh, so the library I've written call is called Fang. It's only about 300 lines. Um, and I'll show you that soon. Um, so first of all, Fang I describe as a dependency injection framework. You should first define what dependency injection is. It's a general sort of pattern where the code you write doesn't actually directly refer to things that it needs. Instead, it asks something else for them. And the things that it need, in some languages, they're classes, but they can also be libraries or objects. Um, and a dependency injection framework is that other thing that it uses to get its dependencies. Um, in a lot of big languages like Java and C Sharp, a lot of big O, classical OO languages, it has some other names, like an inversion of control container, an IOC container, or informally often just a container. Here's a container library I wrote, and that means something to Java people. Um, but I'm just going to call it a dependency injection tool or a dependency injection framework. Um, dependency injection's most popular in Java and C Sharp, and there are loads and loads of libraries to do it. Um, a lot of them use XML for configuration. A lot of them, C Sharp has its own, more XML. Um, they make a lot of use of what we'd think of as classical OO features like um, static typing, interfaces, uh, XML, and most of all, most of them assume that the smallest bit of code that you're going to ever deal with is a class. Now, none of these are popular ideas in Python. We don't like static types. We don't use interfaces that much. Uh, we have informal interfaces. Uh, and we don't always deal with classes. Sometimes we just talk about functions. So from that, why would you even want dependency injection in Python? Um, usually we think of it as a tool for other languages. We don't need it. We can just use monkey patching or all these great mocking libraries we have. Um, we can just write some extra dynamic code that'll figure out what we need. It's, it's not something we need in Python is the usual school of thought. So for me, the best argument for dependency injection is easier unit testing. We have lots of great mocking tools, but it's still a bit of a hassle because often you're trying to mock things where you just can't get at the scope that you want to change names of. So for those of you who haven't really used mocking tools much, the idea is that there's a particular scope in Python somewhere that has a name that refers to a real object, and for the purposes of your test, you want to replace it with something else. And these tools, if you can get a reference to that scope, that object, that module, you can kind of say, just take that name and reassign it to this fake object I wrote. But sometimes you can't even get at the scope. And this is a fairly common pattern where you'll have a module that defines some classes. And then the conventional way to use that module is the last thing the module will do is just create uh, a single instance of the class. And the conventional way to use the module is just to always use that instance. But that's kind of hard to test because if you've written your testing some code that uses that, by the time by the time you want to replace that instance with something else, it's by the time you can. Uh, there might already be you know, a bunch of other things referring to it that have all grabbed a reference to that at import time. Um, so by the time you want to mock things out, it'll be too late. 
The other problem is that sometimes you forget to mock something. Um, you write a library, it refers to some files on disk or does some network I.O. Uh, you write some mocks for it, and then you upgrade the library, it does a few more things, and you forget to mock out one of the new things that it does. And suddenly, your unit test suite is performing real network I.O., real disk I.O. You might not even realize until suddenly you run your tests on your laptop when you don't have internet, and they fail, even though they've always passed. This can happen. We, we're human, we make mistakes. Um, dependency injection can be a solution for this. And sort of the strategy I have is looking at how things are done in languages other than Java and C Sharp. So a good example is JavaScript. People who have written any JavaScript, um, particularly on Node.js or some of the more modern uh, browser JavaScript libraries, there's this fairly common pattern of, in JavaScript, all you really have are functions um, for doing scoping. So there's common, a common pattern of basically defining a function scope just to wrap up all the different pieces of your module. And the way you get your dependencies is you just take them as arguments. And so you do a bunch of stuff. Um, your dependencies are arguments here. And then at the end, you, you build an object that is your module. And then at the end, you, at the end of defining all, all the pieces of your module, you return that. And whatever is responsible for loading your module will pass in these dependencies, uh, or whatever it decides will meet those dependencies when your module is loaded. So this is actually much closer to how we might do it in Python. Um, the idea of dependencies aren't described with strict interfaces or classes, <coughs> they're just values with names. They get passed in as parameters, but at the end of the day, a function argument's just a name. You can pass something else in. Um, and it's a lot like how we do things in Python with duct typing. Uh, as long as something sort of meets the needs of, as long as a dependency meets the needs of the code that uses it, everything's fine. We don't, we don't strictly check interfaces, uh, although you could if you wanted to. Still, we're probably not going to write Python like this, where we have a function that takes dependencies and that returns your module and you know, the way, the way you, you don't actually import things anymore, you just call functions that return modules. And everything you write is in a giant function. Your entire module is just one big function definition. I can't see that taking off. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe someone might use it, but I can't see it catching on. Um, so we need some language in Python to talk about dependencies that matches the idioms of Python. So from this, I wrote Fang. So Fang has three core principles. Um, resources or, or things you depend on are just names. Um, they're not interfaces or factory classes or whatever. Um, providers are just functions. Sorry, I, I misspoke. Providers are just functions. They're the ones that aren't factory classes. So a resource is just a name that you talk about. It's just a string. Um, and then the things that actually provide those resources are just some sort of callable. And lastly, configuration isn't XML. It's just Python code. <coughs> so this is the syntax for Fang. Um, so you just create this little di utility function, and then when you write a function that has a dependency, you just decorate it with di.dependsOn, and then multiply here is just the name of the resource you need. Um, and then the important thing here is this is really just annotation. Um, di doesn't actually know what it's going to use to meet multiply. It's just a string that it talks about. It's just a name for the thing that this function needs. It's not until here when we actually reach the entry point of our program. Uh, this is if our program's running as a script. If you've imported it as a module, you might write some other code to, to set this up. But when program, the full program execution is going to start, not just importing things, you then actually register what will meet that, what will provide that resource multiplier. And in our case here, it's just a function that returns the value two. So until this line here, um, Fang doesn't really have any idea what, what actual concrete implementations um, meet up 
what concrete implementations are used to provide a particular resource. And that's really useful because you know then that some code at import time hasn't grabbed a reference to a real thing that you might want to replace later because you're doing testing. Uh, so the DI object is really simple. It's really just um, a combination of these three different pieces. Uh, so you have a register for dependencies, a register for things that provide uh, resources to meet those dependencies, and you have a resolver that just kind of combines the two together to do the lookups. Uh, and then you have some, a decorator down here, um, which is just sort of convenience to provide a, a nice way of talking about dependencies. Um, registering dependencies is just a decorator here. Um, so as I said, providers are just loaded in at your program entry point. Um, and the resolver matches up um, providers or the results of providers with actual dependencies. <coughs> Multiple dependencies, you just uh, decorate your function more than once. Uh, and the resolve is unpack function will just give you the things that you, your function needs as a tuple so that you can easily just assign them uh, using tuple unpacking. Uh, if you want to do dependencies on classes, the idea is that you, you resolve your dependencies and unpack them in your constructor, uh, and then you just save them to self. And this makes unit testing much, much easier. So here's our function with multiple dependencies. Um, what we do... Um, we first clear out the, the list of registered providers, uh, and you'll, you'll have to do this between each test, which is a bit of a caveat, but um, then you just register the values you want for multiplier and offset. Um, these can also be functions. Um, really, a provider is just a callable that takes no arguments. Um, so in this case, this is just a helper that will, will create a little lambda that takes no arguments and returns three. And Similarly, this one will just return one. Um, so you set, you set your providers up. Um, this is a, another helper that will just check that you've actually registered all the appropriate providers for what you're testing. Uh, I'm sorry, that should be multiply and add there. Um, and then you just run the code under test and check the output. But this is all the setup you need to do. There's no calling to a mocking library to replace some names. Um, yeah. So Fang is usable at the moment, but there are some more features I'd like to add um, where I have the syntax done, but not the implementation yet. Um, there's also one important thing. I need to actually put it on the Python package index. I have a set up.py, so there's not too much work left to do on that. Um, I'm hoping I'll get it done in the next couple days, um, probably in the hallways between talks. Um, I'd like to add support for namespaces so that if more than one project is using Fang or you're grabbing dependencies from different projects, you have a reasonable way to talk about them. Uh, so the idea is that you, you set up a default namespace and if you don't say, you know, it's assumed that it's under the default namespace, otherwise you give sort of an absolute <coughs> path. Now I understand that's a bit verbose, so the next thing would be providing a nice way to sort of define um, sort of just syntactic sugar, just aliases, so that you can talk about, a, instead of talking about uh, the Python standard lib, you just, you just say Python. Um, I also want to write a, a bunch of adapters. Uh, well, not really one adapter that will just sort of handle passing bits of the Python standard library into Fang. Um, Similarly for third-party libraries, I don't expect everything to have fang wrapping suddenly. Um, and I also want to make the testing a little nicer um, so that there are easy ways to pass in fake objects and things like that. So that's fang. Any questions?
guess people just come up. Thanks for your talk. It's really interesting. Um, my favourite um, example of dependency injection in Python is uh, the PyTest uh, fixtures. Um, and just how that works for people that don't know is, um, is you just define a whole bunch of functions and then PyTest goes and collects them with a decorator and, and then injects them into your tests using a name matching. Um, I'm just wish wondering the design decision of using the unpack inside of the inside of the function over kind of injecting them via functions. Function arguments. Hey, function arguments, yes. My concern with that is that, um, I mean, it might work okay in unit tests, um, but in other code, I don't really want to crowd up um, the calling signature of a function. I think after you do that with a few dependencies, uh, instead of writing a function that just does something with A and B, um, it does something with A and B and then takes, you know, three other libraries to do various things. I, I felt that, I did consider doing that, but I felt that it would make the calling signature of the function too crowded. Um, and, and in addition to the simple case of a function, um, it gets confusing, like, what do you do when you have classes with multiple inheritance? Although um, Amber, who was just here, would probably argue that you don't. You don't have multiple inheritance, that's a trap. Um, but still, uh, certainly things like constructors often get really crowded, um, plus object constructors get really crowded very quickly if you have multiple, if you have any level of in inheritance, really. I just didn't want to add to that. Um, but yeah. Thanks. I was going to ask the same question. Okay. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a strong believer in uh, the concept of passing arguments around in function signatures. I'll ask a different question. Um, have you measured the overhead of doing the DI this way, having to uh, unpack the dependencies in the function whilst executing? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, under the hood, um, so the DI object, the dependency uh, register, the resource provider register, under the hood they're both just using a couple dictionaries to keep track of everything. Um, one's a dictionary mapping functions or classes, you know, objects to names. And the other one is the other way around, mapping names to, to callables that provide those things. Um, so I expect that's fairly fast, but I haven't done profiling. And if it does prove to be too slow, then I guess I would jump in there and figure out how to re-implement some of it in C, although I, I doubt I can do better than the dictionary implementation in Python. But Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That, that answered my question. Cheers. Any, anybody else? Well, I've got another unique gift for Nathan. Oh. Uh, this one the committee got from the, the very rare and uh, soils around central Queensland, the red clays. Uh, enjoy a unique PyCon speaker's mug. Thank you, Clay. Nathan. Thank you.